if I like that first thing. Let me grab this. We're going to have some fun here. Get y'all waking up. Get your minds thinking. Make you put your phones away so you'll talk to me. Hi, Dennis Sullivan. How are you? You're fine. Well, hold on. we got to get this going here. Now talk. Wow. Uh, well, I, obviously, we don't want to hear Dennis speak this morning uh, because are you shy? Is that what it is? Hold on, check, check. How about on the handheld? Because we're gonna do some trivia, Dennis. Are you good at Den are you good at trivia? You're not? But you're from Illinois, so this will be a good start. Why is that bad? That's not bad. It's not bad that you're from Illinois. Uh, okay, do me a favor. Stand up, stand up, Dennis. Just do me a favor. Because you are from Illinois, this will be a good warm-up. Face the camera so people see it, or just at least the audience. Um, okay, so you're from O'Fallon, Illinois. Which is close to what? East St. Louis. East St. Louis. So basically, you're from Missouri. Pretty much. Okay. All right. So then you might not Fight know Tiger's these. Fight. Fight. Okay. Let go of the Tigers. Hold on to that just a second for me because I want to hold this. We're going to do a little trivia. Okay. This is Chicago trivia. All right. So now let's look at the screen and you're going to win a fabulous prize. <laughs> okay. Uh, question number one. Let's look at the trivia here. Now remember, he is from almost in St. Louis. Can we see the trivia? Okay, this is going to be exciting. Are you I, so I nervous? Okay, now. okay, now think it through. Now I realize you probably had a late night. What did you do last night? Just bring up question number one. Which of the following items would you not expect to find at, as a Chicago-style hot dog topping? The yellow mustard dill pickle spear, the sport peppers, tomato slices, sweet pickle relish, chopped white onions and celery salt, or coffee grounds and chewed bubble gum? I want to guess. Are you going to guess? Yeah. Hold the microphone closer. I'm going to guess. D. Okay. D. Is that right? As Coffee in grounds. Yes, D is in Dennis. Oh, yes. It's like we oh, planned right. that. Look. Here you go. How about 20 bucks at a Pizzeria Uno? It's local, so don't take that back. You have to eat this in the next few days. Okay, okay eat it in the next. Sure, Dennis. Thank you for mamming me. That's nice. Mick, I might have to use you right away. Come on. Look at you, because someone's been to the gym. Uh, obviously spending a lot of time. To, to, hold on to that, Mick. Now, Mick, where are you from? Uh, BC, Canada. You're Canadian. Yep, that's maple. Okay. Now, Mick, uh, do me if I don't, don't cheat. Are you cheating already? Okay. What is the tallest building? Don't shout it out in Chicago. Is it Wrigley Field, Pizzeria Uno on Wabash, the Willis Tower, or Chicago Art Institute? Well, not being from around here, I'll have oh. to guess. Okay, oh my word, and he's Canadian, so it could be, okay, take your time. Uh, C. C, Willis Tower! Okay, now, for extra credit, what did Willis Tower used to be called? Uh, Honestly, cheating, <laughs> cheating, I heard it. He is Canadian, we want to see what they can do. Now, shoo, 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 go Thank, ahead. Thanks for the help, Sears Tower. Sears Tower! <laughs> okay, now do you have some free time while you're here, Mick? A little bit. Okay, go out to dinner at Phil Stefani's restaurant. How about it? Oh, thank you. Sure, give it up for Mick, ladies and gentlemen. See, all of a sudden, Anita's looking a little better first thing in the morning because she has actual prizes. Once again, you've all learned this from me two years ago. Uh, it doesn't help you at all to not make eye contact with me because I'm still going to come to you. He's all wrapped up in his little furry sweater, and he's like, please don't talk to me, Anita. It's worth a prize. Do you think so? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to stand if you don't want to, Sam. I know it's been, what did you do? Oh, but you're from Redondo Beach. Oh, it's a three-hour time difference. Is that what it is? Two hours, Two hours here. Yeah, so that's why you're still sleeping at this point. Exactly. Okay, all right. So let's do this. Oh, this is good. Are you a political person at all, Sam? Nope. This will be good. Sam, for extra credit, say your last name. L2 AG. Right, I'll give you a prize for that. Okay, that's good. There you go. All right, and then tell me, what which U.S. president calls Chicago home? Is it Ronald Reagan, who is no longer with us, God rest his soul, uh, Barack Obama, Grover Kling Cleveland, <laughs> dead for years, and Bill Clinton? Which one is it? Barack Obama. Barack Obama, give yourself a round of applause. I'm going to give you another prize. This is going to be good. And I would pay to see you doing this today. Thank you. I dropped one. Thank you, Steve. This here is the Divi Bike Share. Do you bike ride? Try it before you leave because you can't use this back in Redondo Beach. Okay. Do you have bikes in Redondo Beach? 
Right, right you have about like that. So <laughs> in the next few days, how long are you here till Chicago? Yeah. Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Wednesday. I want to see you on a bike. Okay, okay all right, good. That. Okay, good. All right, now remo- let me go over here so I split the difference here. Let's get a lady up. Come on, gal, get up here. Put your big old purse down. Come here. How are we doing? Hi, Tina. Look at you all the way from Seattle, Washington. Hello. It's a beautiful place. Hold on to the microphone. You're making me work too hard. Okay. Now let's try. Oh, this is up your alley. I look at you and I think rapper to the stars. I think you know all the rappers. So who is Chicago's famous rapper? Is it Dizzy Gillespie, Kanye West, Scooby-Doo, or Not So Lil Kim? Lil Kim put on some weight, so she's not so lil. <laughs> okay. So which one is it? It's uh, B. It is B. Kanye West. Did you watch the awards last night? No. He was horrible. Okay, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. There you go. How about that? What did you win, Tina? Tell everybody. The and then get you some reading glasses. Okay. Uh, what did you win there, <laughs> Tina? Uh, it's the Chicago Trolley and Double Decker Bus. Who are you traveling with? Uh, my partner, Cameron. Oh, your partner, Cameron. Yeah. Okay, so you're just friends. Yeah. But wouldn't it be beautiful to, to go on a double-decker bus with Cameron? It sure would. Oh, it would be, oh my word, <laughs> finding love in the Windy City. Okay, sit down. Okay, hi, how are you, Silver Fox? All right, so let me see here. Look at, the, now if this hat right here doesn't make a statement, don't wear that and make me not call you up here. Come here, Sam. Come here, Sam. Stand up. Get up. Get up. I love, okay, now all into the aisle, seriously. So, Sam, where are you from? Australia, Melbourne. Oh, my word! Well, send Matilda, well, send Matilda, you'll come, oh, well, send Matilda. You're not going to win a prize if you don't sing. I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to sing. How are things in Australia? Beg your pardon? I said, how are, <laughs> she doesn't understand. Okay. How are things in Australia? <laughs> They're great. They're Thanks. great. Okay. All right. So, Sam, uh, hold on to that just a second. Okay. So, are you ready for this trivia question? Oh, this is going to be good because you're from Australia. Which of these films do you ever go to the movies? Yes. Okay. So, which one did not uh, did, took place in Chicago? Was it Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. Anyone? 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 That's the movie. Hello? Yeah, Hello. got it. Okay. Uh, the Untouchables, The Blues Brothers, The Sting. Or is it E, they all took place in Chicago? This could be a trick question. I think it might be. Oh, no. Oh, dear. What is it, Sam? It's between A and E. Okay, now keep in mind, Sam, if you are paying attention, none of the other questions have had E. Okay, good. Give it up for Sam. Good. Is that right? Yeah. Have you been to a Pizzeria Uno? No, I haven't. Do you like pizza? Absolutely. Try it. Give it up for Sam from Australia, ladies and gentlemen. Let me come back over here, see what's going on. Hi, sir. How are you? Delfino, is that your name? Uh, yes. Yes. Stand up, Delfino. Where are you from? From Brea, California. From Brea, California. Okay, another time difference challenge. This could be good. What is Chicago's best known nickname? Best known. Is it the Windy City? Is it the Big Apple? Is it the Whole Enchilada? Or is it the Breezy Burg? It's going to be A. The Windy City. Give it up for them. These you folks are good. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna send you. Are, do you like museums? Um, yes. yes. How about that? Passes to the Field Museum. Give it up for them, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Scooting in behind me. I see you. Keep going. You're all right. We can't ask you a question because you're with the Chicago chapter, so you would know all the answers. Mostly. Mostly. <laughs> you better. Uh, okay. All right. Glenn. Glenn Harper from Columbia, Tennessee. Stand up, Glenn Harper. How are you? I'm doing great. How are Good. You? Now, where is Columbia, Tennessee? What is that close to? Uh, south of Nashville. Sure. Okay. All right. Uh, do you know the Tennessee Waltz? I do not. Let's try it. I was waltzing with my darling to the... I don't have the not like That would you. be Tennessee. Yeah. That would be... You just say the state you're from at that point. Yeah. Forget it. Okay. All right. So hold the mic once again. Uh, everyone's making me do all the work. First of all, just because you look like you would enjoy the physical activity, let me just give you a Divi bike share just for looking cute. Okay. And then let's try this. Oh, no. Do you read newspapers? Because you're from Tennessee. I'm teasing. We can't do you read? read. No, no, you can read. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. 
I'm kidding. I love Tennessee. It is a beautiful place. I went there. Stop it. Okay. So, what is Chicago's highest circulated newspaper? The Daily Prophet, uh, the Huffington Post, which is a lot of like gossip. Did you know that, Glenn? You're staring so intently. It's like you don't want to look at my beauty. You're just focused on the screen. You intimidate me. I do. I probably do have a lot of women. Okay. C, the Chicago Tribune, or D, the Oprah. I'm well, say C. well, good. Someone must have thought you were a little. Ah, okay, all right. <laughs> what was it? It was C. It was C, the Chicago Tribune. All right, thank you. You know what? Because I find you somewhat attractive, <laughs> I'm giving you some Chipotle hot sauce uh, from the Frontera Grill. Have you been there? It's the Bayless, that chef, the Bayless, Rick Bayless. Do you ever heard of him? What do you do for fun in Tennessee? Do you ever do anything, Glenn? We don't wear shoes. You don't That's wear fun. shoes? You don't? So you don't go out to restaurants? Wow. Okay. All right. So here. So you're going to bike ride while you're here. You're going to check out the front. Take that. You get a bottle of hot sauce. Now, you, you have to pack that in your bag because I don't know if you know this, that's more than three ounces, and you can't bring that on the plane like that. That's got to go in your luggage. Yeah, I don't want to get that search. No, you don't, want, you don't want that search. You don't want to pat down at, o, at, at Midway or O'Hare, do you? I do not. It could be some fun. <laughs> okay. All right, moving on. Let me go all the way over here. This is fun. We're warming up. Come on in. Grab a seat, people. I tell you what. Hi, Tom. How are you? Thomas Maroney, as I live and breathe, stand up here. Where are you from? Sarasota, Florida. Yes. Okay. Right, <laughs> yeah, just you're right. There. I'm going to answer win. all of your questions. <laughs> I win a ride on the Divi Bike Share Program. Let me put that in my pocket because I just guessed he was from Sarasota. Okay, I'm kidding. Uh, do you ride bike? Here, hold this, Tom. Don't look at the question. Look at me. Look at me. Take the microphone. Now, do you ride bicycles? Oh, yes. You do? Okay, then take this because you're going to try that out while you're here because right. you don't have that in Sarasota. Bicycles? Not that you pick up on the street like the Divi Bike Share well, Program. Depends on who you are. Oh, really? Oh, well, <laughs> then in Sarasota, if you pick up a bike on the street, I believe you're called a thief. That's correct. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's do this. Uh, do you watch TV? Uh, not very often. Okay. But. Well, which of these TV shows is not set in Chicago? ER, The Good Wife, Chicago Fire, which sadly a friend of mine told me last night it's been canceled. I'm not sure, though. Don't get upset. Punky Brewster. Do you remember Punky Brewster? Sort of. Sort of. Or E, they all took place in Chicago. This can be challenging because a lot of the questions don't have, have e, e on them. I got so it. which one is it? I'm going with E. You are smarter than you looked as I approached well, you. I appreciate give it that. up for Tom. You know what I'm going to give you, Tom? How about some uh, chili starter, Texas chili starter. That'll take up some God. weight there. You've got the Divi bike share. And how about some chips? Give uh. it up for him, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for him from Sarasota. I, I believe there will be a party in Tom's room tonight with a little chip, a little salsa after he's ridden the bike. All right, now let's see. Let's go. Let me go down front again. These people were not afraid to move down into the front seats. Uh, so let's go up to them. Uh, this man right here who has turned his iPad off. Hi, Jonathan Ferrante. Stand up. Is that how you say your name? And you're a speaker. I am. Oh, so this should be good. You should know how to hold the microphone and take charge of it. <laughs> sure. Brilliant. Okay. All right. Wow. So what are you speaking about? Uh, trees in the right of way. Trees in the right of way or trees and the right of way or trees are in my flipping way? What are you saying? My trees are smart and they're in the right of way. My trees are smarter in the... I want to hear a little bit of this. What well, is you should have been there yesterday. I wasn't there. I was busy. I'm a busy woman. Okay, so my trees are smart. You've got smart trees? We do. What is smart about them? Um, there's an app for that. Nice! <laughs> nice! Recall on that. Okay, so you take that prize right there. You're going to ride a bike because that's a, a form of smart transportation is the Divi Bike Share pro Program. Okay. Did you really got up in front of a crowd and spoke. Did you really? You can't ride bikes in trees. 
You can't ride bikes and trees. No, you cannot. Thank you. You went to school. Okay, all right. Let's try this. According to legend, whose cow started the Chicago fire? Was it Mrs. O'Leary's cow? Was it Oprah Winfrey's cow? Was it Mrs. Butterworth's cow? Or was it Mrs. Thatcher's cow? I'm going to take a stab in the dark, and I'm going to say A. Mrs. O'Leary's cow. You're right. Give it up for Jonathan. Okay, let me see what I have here, Jonathan. How about some Pizzeria Uno local while you're here? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Give it up for Jonathan. I'm just curious, is your speaking duties, are they done for the day, or can I come I, learn about smart trees? I think I'm done. You are done? Yes. You, just, you think this morning put that nail in the coffin for you, or at what point did you think you were oh, I'm just thinking about <laughs> Mrs. O'Leary's cow. What, a, what are you thinking about Mrs. O'Leary's cow? <laughs> And why it are you looking like a good at me barbecue. and thinking of that? It's, <laughs> obviously, you're not a vegan because uh, you're <laughs> craving meat now at some point, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Sit down, Jonathan. Give it up for Jonathan. Wow. Okay, we have more time. Look at George. Stand up. Oh, you're from Chicago. I can't use you. But you do, look how nice you look, though. You've dressed up in a suit. You're reading your phone. What do you do? You're with Collins Engineering. I'm uh, the CDOT Utility PMO Coordinator. It sounds illegal, but good for you. Okay. The CDOT. PMO Utility Coordinator. Oh, because I, years ago, I worked at the CDOT uh, POP. I was a POP, PDLMNOP coordinator, uh, RSTUV, back in the East office. Okay, good for you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Give it up for, he's dressed so nice. I see it, I call it, I see it. Okay, here's what I'm going to, ah, oh my word, look who it is. It's Phil, uh, Phil, uh, what's his name? Uh, who was married to Marlo Thomas? Phil Donahue, I guess. Phil Donahue <laughs> is here in the house. <laughs> oh my word, or Jerry Van Dyke. Oh, I love this. <laughs> I'm so glad you, I had no idea you were with the American Public Works. How's Marlo doing? Uh, very well. Good. <laughs> How long have y'all been married, Phil? 72 years. 72 right. years? Yes. Oh, you are my favorite person ever, Phil. Marlo, I loved her dad. Now, where are you from? You're from Russellville, Arkansas. Yes. Uh, I've only been there two and a half years. In Arkansas? I'm really from Tennessee. Okay, well, yeah, Arkansas. Yeah, I didn't wear shoes to Arkansas yeah. either. Yeah, you sure don't. You sure don't. <laughs> and your cousins look good there. Okay, all right. Hold on to that, there you go. Take some dinner, there you go, just because you're my favorite. And then why don't you go to the Field Museum? Thank you, give it up for Phil Donahue, also known as Michael Oaks. Pick up, hold on, I'll scooch out of here. He played along, I love when they play along. All right, ladies and gentlemen, did you have a great time yesterday? You did, woo hoo hoo! And you're ready for more exciting good times today, I'm sure. Thank you for that lack of conviction. All right. Well, I got to tell you, we ha I had so much fun uh, yesterday uh, singing songs. So I thought I would do, since we're here in Chicago, and as you know it, it is one of my favorite cities, I thought we'd start with some songs about Chicago. So, Smiley, if you want to go ahead and hit that note for me, we'll sing some so songs about Chicago. I could have sworn there was a band here yesterday. Wasn't there a band here yesterday? Okay, well, uh, I just happen to travel with my own tracks. <laughs> uh, so go ahead, let's sing that song about Chicago, because you don't get these songs in Poughkeepsie. Okay, and jump in. Look at this, we're going to see views of this beautiful city. Sing along with me. Show you around. Show you around. In Chicago, Chicago. Look at that. Oh, you probably haven't gotten out much, but it's gorgeous here in this lovely. The Bean on State Street, that great street. I just want to say, I saw a man. Oh, look at that. The Wrigley Building right there. Oh, and Wrigley Field. Oh. A man, a man and his wife. They had the time, the time of their life in Chicago, my hometown. Now you all know that. Oh, you know what? 
let's do one they can all jump in on because you'll love this. Does everyone know the song, um, uh, My Kind of Town? Oh, someone had vibrato. Nice. Yeah, so it'll be my kind of town. My kind of town. If we could just sell it, just feel it, and just dig down deep and bring that up, and just sell a little bit more. Here we go. Let's try that one. This has a beautiful romantic opening to it, kind of. Sing from down here. Bring it up and out. Oh, I love this city. This is my kind of town. My kind of town. Sway. My kind of, I love it. People who, keep going. People do this my life, you. is calling me home that's right i just love to grin like a clown it's sing my kind of town give yourselves a round of applause ladies and gentlemen give it a come on yell scream cheer jump out of your seats give yourselves a standing ovation seriously get up one guy, a golly bum here, here's a prize for you. Right here, you stood up. Thank you for that. Give yourselves a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And please, at this time, oh, look who it is. It is Larry Stevens. They're not oh. standing, Larry. It's a weak start. It yeah. must be a weak start. Yeah. Larry but Stevens, this is your president-elect <laughs> right here, people. Stand uh, for him. Well, Do something for Larry. I'm... I'm I'm, I don't know what to say. I'm, well, thank you, and good morning, everyone. This is fascinating. We kind of need to get here. We didn't realize we've got a lot of notes here we need to go through, uh, but do you want us to move out of the way? But it's okay. Okay, it's it is okay. all right. It's fine. It's we, fine. Yeah, all right, go on. Well, I've got it here, all the stuff. Well, thank you, Anita. It is thank my you. pleasure. Thank you very it much. is my pleasure. I'm here And for you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome back. Welcome back to another day at Congress that uh, will uh, afford us many opportunities to enrich our lives and, and, and increase our ability to be our, the best that we can be, both personally and professionally. Uh, the uh, general sessions are truly some of the most enriching events in Congress, and today's session is no exception. Uh, but before we introduce today's speaker, I want to remind you of some of the events that will be going on in Congress that uh, will, will enrich your uh, day here. And how and, about others? Anita, would you like to help me yeah, with Yeah, it actually helps out others. Because first off, there's an important thing that you want to do while you're here. Uh, of course, this week to be a part of the APWA's Proud mm -hmm. to Care Blood Drive. Now this year, APWA has partnered with the American Red Cross. It only takes about 45 minutes to help. And That's in case it. you didn't hear about this, Chicago, their metro chapter here, has issued a challenge. Have you heard about this? Yes, I have. Okay, they are challenging every challenge chapter to donate more blood than the Chicago chapter. In the Chicago oh chapter, oh they goodness. have a lot of blood to give. That is. Yeah, so we want to beat them, though, so we can't let them win. I want you to head over there, if you can, to the blood drive located by the bookstore and roll up your sleeves, save a life, and beat the Chicago metro chapter, please. And in mm -hmm. addition to that, helping your chapter uh, win the chapter challenge for your good deed, you might just win what, Larry? Do you know? I'm going to tell you. I'm sorry, you have you are, me. You're you, you just a pretty me. face at this point. Okay, <laughs> yes, if you go over there, you might have a chance to win an iPad. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Today and tomorrow, we will draw one lucky winner for those that donated blood. So you can't beat that. Head on over there today if you can, please. Now, this afternoon, you had the opportunity to be a part of the association's most prestigious event. Do you know what that is? 
Once yes, again, but stand I'm going, there and but I'm look going pretty. To let you tell Come them. back to the awards and recognition ceremony Absolutely. at 5 p.m. in this theater and show your support to our award winners, please. That's later on today at 5. Mm -hmm. Don't forget to visit the bookstore, please. This one-stop shop features publications on nearly every public works topic, uh, whether you're looking to educate your workforce on a new technology, to inform your community about public works, or even besides that, in general, you can increase your own knowledge, which I found out in the audience. And it's very some limited in this case. Might, uh, yeah, some of them might need that. Uh, if you want to increase your own knowledge on a specific topic you might find at the bookstore. And, of course, with the exhibits, there's a lot here. I'm sorry. Just okay. pose and it's do your, something. It's your, um, it's yeah. your, your stage. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, visit the exhibits that are open today from 10 to 3. I'll be there getting to know some of you folks. We have so much going on. Visit one-on-one. -on -one, kick the tires to find out everything you need to know as you go booth to booth. You can also get CEUs by participating and sessions presented by our very smart exhibitors during the Exhibitor Solution Theater sessions. Or go see the hottest technology and find out about great public work apps during there's an app for that. Go find out about smart trees. Right here. Who knew there was a smart tree? Is a crepe myrtle a smart tree? Could be. I'm thinking not. It mm -hmm. kind of droops. Okay, anyway. And, of course, don't miss all the great interviews going on at APWA's Expo Experience booth. That's booth 840. Now, between the education sessions and the exhibit hall, your day will be filled with endless opportunities to discover new and exciting ways to expand your thinking and improve your communities. Now, Larry. Yes. <laughs> You've done so well no, I, just looking handsome. I, just face thank, the thank, crowd thank and kind of look thank studly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, all right. <laughs> Speaking of new and exciting ways to expand your thinking, uh -oh. ladies and gentlemen, take a look at this. Avoiding gridlock requires leadership that can engineer change on a grand scale. As people move back to urban cores, Public Works is challenged to redefine urban transportation beyond the traditional car-centric view. Our next guest is an entrepreneurial leader, having held influential roles in transportation, technology, and consumer services. The co-founder of On The Fly, an electric vehicle street food company, and former director of the Washington, D.C. Department of Transportation, he brought Capital Bike Share to the city, built Streetcar, and overhauled the city's parking system, including the largest rollout of pay-by-phone parking in the United States. He was vice president at Zipcar, helping to shape the young company's brand identity, marketing, and operational standards, and responsible for introducing the unique car sharing concept to the DC region immediately after its birth in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Noted as an unconventional choice for commissioner of the Chicago Department of Transportation, in 2011, he took on the responsibility of improving transportation for Chicago's 2.6 million residents. Ladies and gentlemen, Give a big public works welcome to a renaissance man and proud resident of our host city. Please welcome the commissioner of the Chicago Department of Transportation, Gabe Klein. Meet me in Chicago. Baby, I'll show you around. Meet me in Chicago. Let me take you downtown. I'm coming in and looking funny. I've been all over the world. Good morning. You have to have a good prop, right? Um, this is one of those Divi Bike Share bikes. We're going to talk more about this later, but on behalf of Mayor Emanuel, welcome everybody to Chicago. And uh, good morning. Um, this is really a unique time to be in public works and transportation. We're often rebuilding what was undertaken at the turn of the last century, or if you look at uh, the highway system that was built in the 1950s, we're also in the process of rebuilding that. A lot of these uh, pieces of infrastructure, whether it's rail, uh, sewer, and water, uh, or highway, are at the end of their useful lives. Utilities also want to upgrade their infrastructure and their systems. Here in Chicago, we've got a big smart grid uh, upgrade by ComEd. Um, we've got the AMRP upgrades for people's gas, the advanced main re replacement program, and our water department, our own water department here in the city, is also doing massive upgrades. So that really introduces its own unique 
set of challenges and also opportunities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, how we coordinate all that work with all the users of the right-of-way and take advantage of that. Um, also, how do we upgrade our materials that we're using for sustainability, but also for longevity, uh, particularly when you're rebuilding a, a, a road or a mega project, even like Wacker Drive, which we'll talk about. And then as the video, and that's the coolest intro I've ever had. I've got to get a copy of that. Thank you, uh, uh, APWA, that was awesome. Um, uh, the world is changing, and people are coming back to the urban core. They want a different quality of life. So how do we, as we're rebuilding our cities, and our towns, and even our rural areas, how do we rebuild so we're serving the population that wants to be in those places? Because these facilities will be in place for the next 50 to 100 years. And so you can't take that lightly. You can't really just build or rebuild for today. You have to think about what's coming down the road 10 or 20 years. What are the trends? So today I'm going to talk about what the, the Chicago Department of Transportation under Mayor Rahm Emanuel, and l let me tell you something. Uh, He's a hard-driving boss. So you're going to see a lot today. You're going to see that we're undertaking a lot quickly, um, but that's the personality of my boss, and uh, I love getting a lot done fast. So we're going to show you how we're addressing some of the challenges and how we're building a new Chicago. Let me see if this is working or not. Okay. So first of all, um, a little background. Chicago, for those of you that aren't from here, I know people are from all over the world. I saw at the event last night people from New Zealand and Australia and New Mexico and Texas. Um, Chicago is unique. Uh, it's a very old city, and it's um, the center of freight rail. We got 25% actually of the country's uh, um, uh, freight is, and supplies are coming through the actual city of Chicago. We have 4,091 uh, lane miles. We've got the country's only dual hub airport with American and United. Uh, and then we've also, of course, got the, the, the Midway Airport. And we have the CTA, uh, which is you know, the workhorse of our transportation system and actually carries uh, almost 1.8 million people per day, 800,000 in rail and a million people on bus. But it's not all good news. Um, we're often first in the nation. Uh, we actually battle with LA and New York and sometimes DC for, for, for the title of first in the nation for regional auto congestion. Um, and we have health problems uh, linked um, to a sedentary lifestyle. Um, there's also other issues, people maybe not eating as, as well as they could. Uh, and then of course traffic safety is a big issue in any city particularly if you want to bring people back to live in your city. And uh, a little more history, Chicago, like many cities, lost about 30% of its population over the last half century. And now we're really focused on bringing people back. Um, our transportation system is vast, as is the responsibility that we have to the residents and all the stakeholders here in, in the city of Chicago. So whether it's you know, plazas and bridges and you know, all the public space, um, uh, or traffic signals, or the new Divi Bike Share program, we really cover it all. And we work very closely with CTA. Um, we actually, it's a very interesting history. CDOT built a lot of the CTA infrastructure uh, back in the day, uh, actually city employees. And um, so we still have a very close uh, relationship and have 59 of the stations, and we have most of the underground subway track that we have a long-term lease with CTA on. So when we talk about projects like bus rapid transit, that's something that we partner uh, very closely with CTA. So I'm a, a, a big believer that you have to really know your past to know your future. And um, Chicago does have an amazing past. Uh, rush hour was you know, trolleys and horses and obviously packed sidewalks, as you can see. While every user was present, I wouldn't say that every user was accommodated necessarily. And the bike. So the bike has an incredibly rich history uh, here in Chicago. Um, around the turn of the last century, right when this photo was taken, there were over 220 companies that were devoted to either manufacturing bikes or manufacturing the equipment that made bikes. So we were really the capital of the world in terms of bikes. Um, and there were also, of course, uh, uh, streetcars, uh, and those were the, the, the mainstream ways to get around the city, and of course, walking. 
And the Chicago L started to be built in the late 1800s um, and literally put Chicago on the move. And as I said before, it's still really the workhorse of the city's uh, transportation system. Much of this that you'll see in these pictures actually hasn't changed. The basic infrastructure is the same. And we're going to be rebuilding the, um, well, we're going to be building a new superstation uh, over on Wabash and replacing two stations that are over 100 years old, the same infrastructure that you see there. You know, at first, when cars came out in the early 1900s, they were these fragile luxury items. But thanks to mass production, they quickly became inexpensive enough for the average American to look at own, owning one. In 1900, Americans owned 8,000 cars. In 1920, 8 million cars. So a huge change. And this picture, I think, sums up the rapid change to the system that was going on in the late 20s, where you had everything from horse and buggy to bike to streetcar to the automobile. And of course, the same is true for bridges. The old movable bridge has been updated. Um, and I don't know if you can see, but this is actually a tour. <laughs> this is a packed boat with a tour of the drainage canal, which was considered fun back then. <laughs> so, so much has changed, but so much remains fundamentally the same. And, uh, but if you look close, closely, you'll see great progress. This is the new Morgan Street CTA station, the West Loop that we completed last year, which is really an architectural masterpiece. Um, the old station was torn down in 1948, not replaced. As the community is coming back, it's becoming more mixed use. There's condos, lofts, restaurants, bars. Um, a new CTA station was built to catalyze that, uh, that movement. And the bike, in the past, was predicted to be the future of transportation. And I'll say, under Mayor Emanuel, we're finally realizing or fulfilling that vision. And this is what rush hour looks like today in the city. Coming into the city, you'll see a lot of cars, too, particularly on the expressways. So when I came in um, in May of 2011, after uh, the mayor hired me, we needed to align our vision, he and I, and we needed to work internally within the agency to figure out how we could accomplish as much as possible in as little time as possible, how we could figure out how to maximize our budget opportunities, all the federal programs out there. And so, um, as I did in Washington, D.C., we put together the Chicago Forward Agenda. This is a roadmap towards achieving the mayor's vision through concrete, measurable steps in the realm of transportation. So better construction, great public spaces, safer streets, and support for neighborhood and global business as well. So Chicago Forward really outlines those critical values and principles that we aspire to as the protectors of the city's transportation network, as well as the policies and actions that will help us continually make progress towards those ideals. But most importantly, there are over 120 metrics that we commit to hit over a two-year period. And sometimes people ask me, why do you set these you know, two-year plans in place? And it's because it's really important, I think, for it to be short-term enough that you can set aggressive goals and measure against them and keep people really focused. And when you work for a mayor like I do, who's uh, ultimately uh, accountable to the people, and I know many of you uh, do as well, um, he doesn't want to wait an extra two years or three years. And there's the reality of politics. I hate to say it, but sometimes people don't get reelected. Things happen. Things change. So we want to make sure that we change the direction uh, of the city's transportation system now and fast. So we're going to talk a little bit about rebuilding and renewing our infrastructure, uh, serving Chicagoans, good customer service, and how we fuel our economy with infrastructure. One of the things that we did is we put together a brand for what we were trying to do. And as I said when I opened up, the, our infrastructure for the most part is either 100 years old or about 50 years old, most of it coming due. And so we are, in, in the mayor's words, building a new Chicago. Um, one of our challenging projects, this is one example, was the rebuilding of the Wells Street Bridge. I know many of you have uh, bridges that you either uh, maintain, take care of, or, or your consultants that work on bridges. They're very complicated and technical, and I'm not an engineer, but I have a lot of respect for what these folks 
do every day that maintain our bridges. Um, so this here was a $47 million reconstruction. This is currently underway, by the way. So you can go over there uh, uh, to Wells Street and Wacker, and you can actually see the project. Um, the new bridge has been designed to basically look like the one that it's replacing, because it's a beautiful structure. It's a historic uh, structure. Um, but it's going to provide 50 years of extended service to the city. Now, what's very interesting about this project is that you've got three levels because we are in a city, right? So you've got transit on top, you've got bikes and peds and cars in the middle, and you have boats of all types on the bottom. And this is a bascule bridge, so it's got to open up while we're working on it. Um, because of the multimodal nature of the bridge, because of its position on the river, our engineers have told me that it's basically one of the trickiest projects that they've ever undertaken besides maybe Wacker Drive, which we'll also talk about. Here's a little video that was some animation um, that shows you uh, what, what we basically did as we replaced uh, the, leaf of the, the first leaf of the bridge. And also, one thing you can't see, uh, if you go off screen just to the right, is Junction 18, which is the third busiest train junction in the world, uh, which CTA also did substantial work on uh, this year. Uh-oh, technical difficulty. Okay, we may not play the video. Sorry, folks, wah, wah, wah. But it was really just animation and a little bit of music. Okay, <laughs> so you have to listen to me. Um, um, so anyway, um, you know, this is basically an incredible opportunity to rebuild our infrastructure, and the mayor said, look, we can't shut down the, uh, the uh, CTA lines for very long. So we have two nine-day shutdowns. Uh, and while it's shut down, we have to be able to go in, and, and CTA's got to replace all the track, do all the track work, put it back in place. Um, we'll be open with this new uh, structure uh, by November of this year. Now, connected to Well Street is Wacker Drive. And uh, Wacker Drive, uh, actually last night at the event, I saw the Blues Brothers car. Um, this has been made famous by movies like that, or Transformers. And it carries tens of thousands of people each day on two levels, and it had to be rebuilt in two phases. So you have east-west Wacker, and you have north-south uh, Wacker. So what we did when we rebuilt this, this is an, an example of uh, uh, taking one of these projects and not just rebuilding it in kind. Uh, we used different m materials that, that will last longer. Uh, we also rebuilt it to be considerably safer than it was before. And we rebuilt the Congress Parkway interchange, which is just attached to it, and also some additional green space. The, the total cost of this uh, project was $303 million, and the project funding was authorized in 2009 by Governor Quinn's Illinois Jobs Now bill. So we partner very closely with the state on a lot of these mega projects, uh, um, all of these. Now, in this case, they had the faith in CDOT to actually manage this project, which, which was really nice. And we came in uh, on time, uh, on budget as well. So there's now the next phase, which is adjacent to Wacker Drive from Michigan Ave to Lake Street along the south bank of the main branch of the Chicago River is the Chicago Riverwalk. And so we have a huge opportunity there to rebuild and redefine our riverfront. When you think of, of the, the, the waterfront in the city or, or the riverfront, it's the most valuable real estate that you probably have. And unfortunately, we have not maximized the value of that real estate. I'm going to show you some pictures, and uh, you can see what I'm talking about. So this is the length of it. It's eight blocks total. And in 2005, CDOT actually dedicated the Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, west of Wabash Avenue. And in 2009, completed the first phase of the Riverwalk build-out, two blocks at Michigan Avenue and Wabash, which was funded through tax increment financing. So this project's been in the works for a long time. Now, the design plan includes conceptual ideas for each of the six blocks from State Street West to Lake Street with distinctive identities. In fact, we're actually calling them rooms, um, and they're thematically named. 
the, the coolest feature, though, of this, like if you go to the Riverwalk now, how, how many people ha have been down there on your trip so far? Quite a few. Okay, great. So I'm not sure what your expectation was, but when you got there, you may have expected you could walk the entire length of it like you could in San Antonio, for instance, uh, without going up and down the stairs. Well, you can't. So you basically have to go back up to, to the main level at every block and then back down. We're going to change that completely and also make it ADA compliant. So this is the existing condition. You can see it's very narrow. There are some businesses that operate down there. You wouldn't even know that they're really there, to be honest, um, because when you look over the edge, you can't really see them. So um, this was all part of one NEPA process back in the, in the late 90s and, uh, and 2000s. So uh, Wacker, Wells Street, and the uh, Riverwalk. So when we looked at how to fund this, we looked at TIFIA. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about TIFIA in just a minute. But you can see we're going to really transform it. So we're going to build out 25 additional feet out in, into the river. Um, this particular space, the marina, is designed to accommodate restaurant, retail space, and public seating. It'll also serve as a location for vertical access between Upper Wacker and the Riverwalk level. Dearborn to Clark, this becomes the cove with kayak rental space and human-powered watercraft, can dock there. LaSalle to Wells becomes a swimming hole for the old and the young, uh, and may include a water feature such as a zero-depth fountain. Uh, some of you may have seen something like this at M Millennium Park. Clark to LaSalle. And this is the, the mayor's favorite room. Um, we think people can uh, sit and eat lunch and hang out, but we actually may also be able to have some performance space down there at the bottom. Uh, Wells and Franklin it actually becomes a CPS, a Chicago Public School classroom, so the kids can learn about ecology of the river, there will be floating gardens, and they can also fish down there. And then, of course, we can have special events as well. So we're really talking about a complete transformation. It's going to be about a 98 to $102 million project and with TIFIA, we're able to borrow uh, basically 100% of the funds as part of the larger project. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about TIFIA later. North Lakeshore Drive, I'm going to move through this quickly uh, because there's lots to cover. But as many of you know, uh, Lakeshore Drive is a really key boulevard here in Chicago. It, it links the lakefront and beaches to parks and neighborhoods. Much of it was constructed in the 1930s under the uh, Works Progress I Administration. And most of the bridges and tunnels have reached the end of their useful lives. So we have this very unique opportunity now, and we're going to take some time. We're going to take three years. We're partnering with the state on this and federal highways. And we're going to take three years, and we have a $21 million phase one study underway to work with the public and figure out what does Lakeshore Drive want to be when it grows up. So again, looking back at its history, it was a beautiful drive versus a freeway. And then it became more of a highway. Rebuilt then as an interchange. And so the origins of the Lakefront Drive really date to the earliest days of the park. As Lincoln Park grew eastward, and I encourage you, if you're here for a few days, go to Lincoln Park. It's really beautiful. There's an incredible zoo. There's Peggy Notabart uh, up there. There's a lot of great stuff to see. But park officials built and rebuilt a series of roadways along its migrating eastern edge. These roads at first carried primarily recreational users in carriages, on horseback, on bikes, and on foot. And with the advent of the automobile, however, motorists increasingly used Lakeshore Drive uh, to basically travel between Chicago's business district and the neighborhoods and suburban uh, areas to the north. So you have rising auto traffic volumes, and then you have the pressing need to separate recreational park users from commuters. And this is um, when Lakeshore Drive became just the drive. So the increased utilization has really strained the relationship between the park and the roadway. So we need to achieve a better balance, or a new balance, between the original vision of a park boulevard, the realities of today's travel demands, and the needs of Lincoln Park and its users. Um, we already rebuilt uh, the south side, by the way, back in, uh, I believe, the, the late 90s. So just the north side, we're looking, it's probably going to be around an $800 million project. Of course, we don't know until we get through the 
through the phase two. I'm going to skip through some of this. But this slide, I'll just note, there's a lot of complex infrastructure uh, below the roads, um, a lot of stormwater drainage. Of course, we're on the lake, um, uh, and so there's uh, revetment issues and so on. And this is what the process looks like on a mega project like this. Once we reach consensus on what to build with the state and, and, and the public, then we need to work with the state to identify funds and, and the feds, of course, to rebuild it. All right, now we're going to talk about Bloomingdale Trail. This project is really exciting. Um, this has been on the books since 1998. And um, I'm happy to announce that we're actually going to be uh, putting a shovel in the ground tomorrow. So if you happen to be around tomorrow afternoon, yes, <laughs> uh, uh, we will be uh, out, out with the mayor uh, announcing this project. Um, we have numerous partners on this project, um, Trust for Public Lands, the Department of Housing and uh, Economic Development, uh, Park District, um, Friends of the Bloomingdale Trail. So many people have worked on this for so long, but when the mayor came in, he said, you know what, let's stop talking, let's start building. And so we really got to work on, on, on design. We did the phase one design. The park district partnered with us. They did the phase two design. And then we're going to start building it uh, tomorrow. So the trail and park will run along an unused elevated trail. It was a uh, Canadian uh, Pacific, if I remember correctly, rail line, two point, almost 2.7 miles. So it's going to be the longest uh, elevated trail in the country. Um, and it'll link four neighborhoods from Humboldt Park to Bucktown and provide park space where there really isn't much. The, the, the design is complete, and the mayor said, basically when the mayor came in, he said, look, I want to be able to ride my bike from one end to the other by the end of 2014, period. <laughs> we said, okay, mayor, we'll figure out a way to do it. So we're going to do it in phases. Um, the first uh, construction contract was awarded uh, just a few weeks ago for $54 million, and that's taking care of all, I think it's 37 viaducts, so we have to shore them up and then actually making it a, a functional trail. Then there's going to be another about $37 million worth of work which will be done to really beautify it. And then also Trust for Public Lands has been working on a lot of parks uh, at the entrances. So here's a before picture, and this is what it's going to look like after. People are already running on it even though it's not legal. Um, and you can see it's um, not the most uh, attractive space. It's going to be beautiful. Now, probably it's not going to look that vibrant with the trees that tall from day one. That may take a few years to get there. Um, the Park District and, and Trust for Public Lands is really doing a spectacular job. They've already got, I think, four or five of the parks open, these gateway parks, uh, to the active trail above. Whoops, and there's the western trailhead. Um, uh, which will be functional and ready to use by the fall of 2014. Okay, so we talked about freight earlier. So I'm going to touch a little bit on the CREATE program, which is a series of projects, I believe 73 in, in all. And these range from uh, grade separations, because we're here in the city, and so you've got passenger rail, you've got freight rail, you have cars, you have trucks, you have everybody often trying to get across the same space, which leads to backups and traffic jams, and there's an old sort of joke, it's not totally a joke, that it takes um, two years, or I'm, I'm sorry, two days to get from the port of Long Beach to Chicago, and then two days to get through Chicago. Um, it's better. It's about, like, we've cut about 25, 30% of that now. But there's a long way to go. So as I said, Chicago is America's rail hub with 1,300 trains passing through. Um, about 500 freight and about 760 passenger rail. Chicago handles, as I said, one-fourth of the nation's freight traffic. That's 37,500 rail cars. It's also a very big intermodal area, so you have a lot of switching where trains are coming down from Canada or from the West Coast or East Coast. They come here and they switch their containers onto trucks for, for the remainder of their trip. And 46% of all the intermodal units in the U.S. touch Chicago. As you can see from this slide, there's a diverse mix of goods that come from all over the world and traverse Chicago. And that's why 
at a national level, people are interested in what happens in Chicago, and that's how the CREATE program came to be, because the CREATE program is viewed by the federal government as a set of projects of national significance. Because if we can speed things up through Chicago, that helps everybody cut their costs and get goods more quickly. We're one of the top 10 busiest ports in the world, and judging from this, I think we're the, we're the busiest non-Asian port and busiest in the United States. So CREATE is a 3.8 billion public-private partnership. I think when it first started, it was about a 2.3 billion. But unfortunately, it gets more expensive every year that we wait to build this stuff. And so uh, the, the, the point of this, you know, just to summarize, is really to improve freight, but also ultimately to also improve passenger rail through Chicago. And that's something that we're very, very focused on. Here are all the goals. You can read for yourself. Um, that's actually a picture of a truss that we moved into place from 130th in Torrance. Um, it was built just a, adjacent to the site, and then using these giant, like NASA-type space shuttle movers, we actually moved it into place last year. I'd show you a video, but it probably won't work. <laughs> um, so you can see that we funded quite a bit, over a billion dollars, but that means that there's a long way to go. We have one project down at 73rd Street that's about $750 million for this one project. And then there's a whole lot of grade separations. Okay, something else that the mayor is very focused on is moving more people in less vehicles, except for bikes, because they don't really uh, Im impact the environment. But we know that our roadways can be much more efficient this picture is a great picture, I think, because it shows how many people you can take on an articulated bus uh, versus a bunch of cars, um, or actually three buses, a bunch of cars. Those are the, the people on the left just standing in the street. That's why we're so congested here in this region. But we also have a land use problem. I mean, the fact is that if so many people hadn't left, if we hadn't lost 900,000 people to the suburbs, then those people wouldn't be fighting traffic every day to get in from the suburbs. So it's a combination of uh, finding the most efficient way to move people through the city and then also make it attractive for people to move back into the city, which means better schools, better public safety, better transportation, better public space, and so on and so forth. Now, the Central Loop uh, Bus Rapid Transit um, is a really exciting project because it gives us an opportunity not just to take a street or streets in the city, Washington and Madison that have too many lanes for cars. And, and keep in mind that we used to have one of the biggest, most robust streetcar systems in the United States. So when the streetcar systems went away, de facto, that space just got given to the automobile. And so in many cases, what we're doing is we're just taking that space back for mass transit. We don't have the money to build the streetcar system. It would cost upwards of $20, $25 billion to put the streetcar system back which we unfortunately got rid of. Um, but what we can do is create rail-like service with bus. Whoops. And this is the after. Uh, th that's on Washington Street. So you can see we have our nice wide sidewalks that we have now. We'll have a protected bike facility. We'll have a platform in what used to be a car lane. And then we'll have a bus-only lane that'll likely be enforced by camera. Um, and still two car lanes, and then at the end of the street, uh, turn lanes to make sure that we keep the operating efficiency maximized. This Central Loop BRT will run from Union Station um, to, uh, so it will connect all of those metro lines at Union Station, Ogilvy Center, and then go to Millennium Park, then ultimately Navy Pier. Now, there's the basic sort of street uh, uh, reconstruction. Uh, or reallocation of space, and then there's technology. So traffic, uh, or tran transit signal priority, excuse me, um, allows the bus to switch the signal uh, as it's coming. The signal knows that the bus is coming and will modulate uh, based on, on the need of the bus. And this technology is getting very uh, sophisticated. You can also add sensors and various other things, which we're even doing in our bike lanes, which we'll talk about. And this is basically how it works. It sends a, a, a request through the AVL, and then it's told yes or no, you can go. 
And, and actually, some of the technology is getting so sophisticated that it can move the buses based on what the other buses are doing behind it or ahead of it, or how many people are on the bus, which is really fascinating. So immediately south of Union Station, we'll be building a BRT uh, transit center next year. Um, this is going to be uh, a, a very nice change for CTA. Um, it'll uh, also have a connection from Union Station underground uh, to the center. Because as some of you know, how, how many people have been here in winter? Yeah, it's a whole different ballgame. You were very good to hold your conference here now. It's beautiful now, although it's going to be hot today. But in the winter, it's bitterly cold and windy. Um, so that's going to be a big boon for people. Uh, this is what it'll look like. You know, basically, we want to increase the intermodal connectivity, multimodal also, and provide really high-quality transit layers that intermesh seamlessly. seamlessly. So we envision multimodal hubs with um, car sharing, uh, bike sharing, standard bus, bus rapid transit, uh, rail, uh, um, uh, Amtrak, and so on and so forth. Uh, also EV charging, uh, all linked together physically and technologically. Then our next project that we're, we've already started working on, we're going to start constructing the downtown east-west BRT uh, by the end of this year, and we'll have it done in about a year. But then we're working on the phase one. Actually, CTA is taking the lead on this, on the Ashland bus rapid transit line. And for those of you that know uh, Chicago history uh, and, and our rail system, you know that we have a, a sort of traditional hub and spoke system like Washington, D.C. and many other places. And so uh, they've looked for decades at how could we connect all of these lines north and south through the city. Well, it's challenging. Uh, they looked at light rail. They looked at a new subway system. Unfortunately, those didn't happen. And now people have planning fatigue a bit. And that's understandable. So what's nice about bus rapid transit is, comparably speaking, we can do it for much, much cheaper. And as you can see, with um, even platform, uh, off, uh, off board fare collection, TSP, and so on, it can really feel like rail. And we think it can have the economic effect that rail has. We know that when we build a transit station, suddenly all the real estate in the community goes up, and everybody wants to live there, and businesses start sprouting up. We think we can do the same thing with bus and link the city together, every major rail line in the city. And the fact is, BRT is faster than regular bus. We think we can get it up to CTA level service. CTA runs on average about 18 miles an hour. We think we can get this up to almost 18, between 17 and 18 miles an hour. So um, you'll still have car lanes bus lanes, parking lanes, but there will be some sacrifice because we only have 70 feet. So we'll likely have to give up one of those car lanes. But one of the things that I, I, like, I like to point out to people, because it's always very controversial, whenever you get rid of a car lane, people, some people get very upset. And, and we understand that. But this is a system, this is a network. Just like the human body and all the blood you know, going through our veins is, is a network. And if for some reason we remove one lane here, we think cars will move over to Western, will move to other places. Also, we're counting on people um, actually getting out of their cars to some extent because we have higher quality uh, transit service. All right, we're going to switch gears here, and we're going to talk about coordination of projects. So as I said, uh, we've got a lot of stuff going on here in the city, and we started in our first year here we, we put together the project coordination office with, uh, with some private contractors at, at, at Collins Engineering, and then with our own technology group at Do It, we actually built our own system. And uh, we knew we had to do it quickly because all of a sudden there were over a billion dollars worth of projects going on in the street. An incredible uh, amount of work. This map represents all the 2012 projects. Those little red X's, those are conflicts. And let me tell you, businesses, People, uh, 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 residents, and politicians hate nothing more than seeing the street torn up three times in one year because nobody coordinated that work. On top of it, uh, it's a waste of money because it's taxpayer money, whether it's the utilities, uh, whether it's our own water department, or whether it's CDOT tearing up the street. It's really the taxpayers that are funding that. And so what we figured out how to do is to um, map out in advance. We've asked all utilities for a two-year 
plus plan. Really, we'd, we'd like a four-year plan. And then we bring them in every week using our technology tool. We figure out how to split up the work, how to work together. So maybe you need to get into the street people's gas, and maybe water was going to go in there next year. Well, let's get everybody in there at once. And I tell you what, if you do that, we were going to pave it, we'll pave it. You pick up the ADA ramps, which are not cheap. Um, it's been a huge success. Very conservatively, the city saved $10 million in its first year. Um, in reality, we really got about $20 million worth of work out of it. Uh, but it's a tough calculation. Um, and at this point, we are sort of forcing the different users of the right-of-way to collaborate and coordinate. And at first, they were kicking and screaming a bit. And now, I think they really appreciate how much time and money they're saving by putting the front end work in. This is the conflict re resolution process. Um, there is an in-person uh, piece to it because it's really important to be able to talk through these issues versus just emailing back and forth and doing it on, on a computer. Um, this is allowing us really to get more work done in the city with less disruption at a lower cost to taxpayers. And the mayor's got a very aggressive plan uh, for repaving, uh, for gas main install, and water. What we're trying to do is no longer tear up streets where there was work just done. So we have a strict moratorium now on our streets. If you do need to get in there, you're going to pay a big fee to get into that street because we want to incentivize all the companies, the telcos, etc., to get in and get out. There's an example project uh, just by, by coordinating the ADA, ramp, ADA ramps, there's a $30,000 savings. And then there's special events. Uh, Transformers has been filming. There were about 45 projects that Transformers actually uh, affected. So um, that's also uh, an important component. In terms of funding infrastructure, here's a summary of uh, CDOT's funding history. And as you can see, overall, it's gone up. Uh, we're also dramatically increasing our revenues. Um, the TIFIA loan program was really important for us, particularly on the Riverwalk project and then recently for the airport for the O'Hare uh, modernization for, uh, for rental cars. So this is a, uh, basically, you get the overnight treasury rate. So right now it's 3.83%. It was actually a percentage lower about six months ago. Um, and uh, under MAP21, they actually upped it by a factor of 10. So a big increase... You know, you're seeing less, uh, you know, grant money, but if you're willing to borrow, uh, you're, and, and for projects like the Riverwalk, where we think there would be a cash flow positive return from taxes and people coming to, to the city and spending, it's really a no-brainer. We've also relied, uh, and not all of you have CMAC funding, you, you have to be in a, in a non-attainment area for air quality, but if you do, it can be a very, nice way to fund projects like this, uh, or uh, bike and ped bridges, um, or new transit stations, anything to reduce congestion. And that's one of the things when I came in, we were able to do is rejigger that uh, for the next five or six years to the tune of about $300 million, which really affected our ability to launch projects like this, which were 80% federally funded. And then there's the, the infrastructure bank. Um, uh, which attracts capital from anybody, basically, whether, you know, it, it can be, uh, you know, big banks, um, it can be um, uh, any type of, of investor, and it basically allows the city to look at more interesting ways to fund infrastructure, typically with a seven-year payback. So there's got to be a high return. So the first project is um, uh, uh, energy retrofits, where you can definitely see that return in seven years. And I have a video, but I bet it won't work. Let's see. And this is my fault, because I switched out the presentation at the very end. Um, you can watch this video, though. If you go to um, cityofchicago.org, you can watch a video where the mayor, uh, Bill Clinton... Um, oh, is it actually playing? Holy mackerel. Of course, we may not have any sound. All right, well, sorry about that. But um, basically what they're saying is this is the first infrastructure trust uh, in a city in the United States. Um, and you can see there our infrastructure is sort of crumbling.
and we need to find alternative ways to pay for it. So Bill Clinton came. I wanted to be here today because. Oh, here we go. What you are doing here Tell you what. is the first, in effect, infrastructure bank using private capital that any city in the United States has established. This is a huge deal. We have a number of banks and financial institutions, and in fact, the labor insurance company, who all have agreed to about $800 million of financing for these projects. The first project that we'll be announcing for financing through this project will be for a cross-agency energy efficiency program. So by aggregating the different projects into a large financing program with city, schools, park district, etc., we are offering to the finance world a language they can understand. So with a couple hundred million dollars of energy efficiency financings, we can actually get better, better rates, better terms for our taxpayers. And the importance of that from this project is that we'll not only get a lower cost financing, but we'll get higher energy savings because we can do more projects than we otherwise would have been able to do. So the infrastructure trust is another way, one more tool in the toolbox to shape our future, meet the challenges of our future, try to control our own destiny, and most importantly, create, in my view, the economic competitiveness and the job growth that are essential to building a modern economy. All right, thanks AV Techs for helping me out. Okay, so next, we're gonna talk about safety. We're gonna talk about providing as many transportation options, options and choices for Chicagoans as possible, and how do we bake sustainability into everything that we do. So you can see here, um, we've got a mode shift happening slowly. And right now, in urban areas, you have 50% of trips, and ur urban areas includes the immediate suburbs, 50% of trips in urban areas are less than three miles. So 28% are actually less than one mile. That you could easily cover these distances walking or biking. Yet 65% of trips under one mile are made by car. And it's not that people don't want to get out of their car, but they're in the habit. And we have incomplete streets with incomplete sidewalk and bike lane networks. So we make it dangerous or unpleasant to walk, bike, or take transit. Um, we also need to recognize that our streets are a real community resource. And we need to rethink what's the highest and best use of our streets. And we, we think that single purpose, vehicle dominated streets versus complete streets with multiple uses can be inefficient and unsustainable, and they can actually hurt our, our economy as well. So, the city of Chicago adopted a complete streets policy in 2006. Um, you can read it there for yourself, but it's basically a promise that at every stage of the project development process, that all users will be considered. And you can see, again, vehicle, mile travel, vehicle miles traveled are down. And Commuting, for instance, by bike is up. We hit um, a, a maximum, I think, in uh, 2004 of around 8.2 billion uh, VMT, which has gone down to 7.2 billion in 2011. Some of that is gas costs, some of that is where people choose to live. And so when we put out our complete streets design guidelines, we called out clearly that we are going to prioritize, as the indicator species of a healthy city, the pedestrian then the transit user, which is also a pedestrian, then the bike user, which is also a pedestrian, and then the car user, which is also a pedestrian. And some people might say, well, why are you putting the auto fourth? Because the auto has been de facto number one for a long time, and that's not the indicator species of a healthy city, one where the car just sort of rules the road. So here's an example of a complete streets with the four component parts, the pedestrian realm, that interstitial area where you have tree boxes and so on, the vehicle realm, and the median. Now over 500 uh, cities, regions, and states have adopted complete street policies, including 130 uh, last year. Um, as well, we've also put together the Chicago uh, pedestrian plan, the streets for cycling plan, uh, that calls for 645 miles of bike facilities, and soon our sustainable urban infrastructure guidelines as well. All of this, by the way, is available on our website. I'm going to move quickly because I got about 10 minutes here. Um, 
So basically, this is a pro-people, pro-livability, pro-business, and pro-resident strategy for our city. We do have a website, and I encourage you to check it out. We just launched it about two weeks ago, chicagocompletestreets.org. It's really geared toward the consumer, um, people to see you know, what's going on in their street, um, what their modal options are, and so on and so forth. It's a one-stop shop. Um, and then when you're building a complete street, you can also bake sustainability into everything that you do. And so this is a great example of this project of policy in action. I think Janet Atarian is going to be speaking later and can also touch on this. This was her project. Um, this is the Blue Island uh, Cermak area of the city in Pilsen. And you can see this was pre-construction. This is a, a, an industrial neighborhood that's going through a change, and really a change more so on one side of the street than the other, where you're starting to see businesses pop up, schools go in, and more residents. So it's a tall order to figure out how do you merge all of those uses, because we don't want to get rid of the industrial use. We're very proud of the industrial heritage of Chicago, and we want to keep those jobs there, and we want those companies to feel welcome. So this project's uh, sustainability goals included stormwater management, water efficiency, transportation, energy efficiency, recycling, and so on and so forth. And then we had to monitor all of it as well. And there's so much going on that you don't even see. One of the really innovative uh, features that's hidden to the eye is the inside traffic lanes are actually coated with self-cleaning photocatalytic cement, which absorbs uh, nitrogen oxide emissions from car traffic and actually cleans the air. There's a picture of it in just a minute. So here's a before. There's an after with bioswales and rain gardens and so on drought-resistant plants, native plants. Um, here's the project as it's being built. There's the photocatalytic cement pavers, uh, where the parking lane is and the bike lane, which also provides uh, drainage. Now, here's the greatest part of this project. People say, oh, I'd love to do all this green stuff, but it's too expensive. Well, guess what? It's, it costs 21% less than comparable projects that year because we didn't have to put in all the sewer and uh, in infrastructure that you would under the street, because we used natural infrastructure. And it came in 30% less than we thought it would, because we thought it was going to be a little bit more expensive. Um, it's also beautiful. Uh, we were able to coordinate with the school and create water features, and also um, educate people about why we have dual sol solar wind-powered lights and uh, provide education for the kids. So every light, uh, every one of those uh, pedestrian lights actually has an education component so the kids can read about it. And I encourage you to take a, you can take a self-guided tour down there and there's more information on our website at chicagodot.org. And soon the, the, the sustainable urban infrastructure guidelines will be out and we'll be basically baking these features into everything that we do. So the pedestrian plan really looks at the pedestrian experience as a whole, not just best practices for ped safety. And I think it's one of the best um, ped plans out there because it really looks at connectivity, livability, and health goals, but also in terms of safety. And so we are redesigning our streets uh, for safety, and we've actually um, looked at uh, all of the zones around schools and parks. There's 1,800 schools and parks in the city, and we know that we've got a traffic safety problem. We've got a lot of speeding. Um, and so some of the, the more innovative things that we're doing, again, old is new, is like the PED all-way crossing. Um, how many people are, actually, is there anybody from Denver here, or Baltimore, or New York City? Denver, okay. So um, this was known as the barn stance. So this is a modified barn stance. Um, so every third cycle, you can cross uh, all way. But this was a great experiment for us uh, at State and Jackson in an area where you've got double the number of pedestrians that you do uh, uh, vehicles. Now, we talked about the 1,800 schools and parks. So we've got safety zones um, around those schools and parks because there's a recognition that at 20 miles per hour, which is the speed you're supposed to be doing, there's a 95% chance that somebody's going to live if they're hit by a car. At 40 miles per hour, there's a 20% chance that they're going to live. And so we've got uh, 50 sites that we implemented uh, over the last year with a lot of different infrastructure improvements. 
And um, we already have the largest red light enforcement program in the United States that's been very successful with a 73% reduction in pedestrian fatalities and 60% overall reduction in fatalities uh, two years before and after. So the speed enforcement uh, will be rolling out a number of, actually some of the cameras are in, in operation now and being tested. Um, and uh, our legislation specifies that we can't have more than 360 units. If, even if we rolled out 360 units, that would, be, that would cover about 5% of the city. But the idea is to change the way people view the city and how you can drive. We also know that proactive traffic enforcement makes roads safer, reduces traditional crime, and improves the quality of life in neighborhoods. There's a really tight correlation between um, traffic crime and traditional crime, and crashes and injuries and traditional crime. Not everything we do costs a lot of money. We have a lot of very inexpensive type projects to improve the quality of life for people. And the Make Way for People program aims to uh, do that at very, very low cost. In fact, we have zero budget for it. So um, these are really public-private partnerships, and they're partnerships with SSA's special service uh, associations around the city. And it's really what we call our tactical urbanism uh, project, where we go in, take a parking space or two or three, and we change it into cafe space, park space, not just for one individual business, um, but for the entire uh, uh, neighborhood. And we launched it as a pilot last year. It expanded this year. Uh, here's one you can see right up at um, Lake Street and State Street, the gateway. Here's uh, down south, 47th and Champlain, up in Andersonville. And this one just launched. If you get a chance to get up to Southport and Addison, absolutely beautiful. These, these are designed uh, typically by architects, and um, this one is just absolutely gorgeous and extends into the sidewalk as well. Okay, we're going to talk real quick about bikes. Um, so when we look at creating bike lanes, bike infrastructure, it's really about all users of the right-of-way. And this is a great example on South Chicago, where beforehand we had a big speeding problem, and we had an inefficient roadway. Afterwards, yes, we have a bike facility, even though there's not that many people using it yet, but they know that it's there. And we've added a turn lane to make the operations of the road more efficient, and speeds have dropped dramatically. Protected bike lanes is a big push uh, for our mayor, and he committed to 100 miles of protected bike lanes. And you can see that we are well on our way, and since we've taken office, um, it's increased dramatically. This is an example of one down south at 55th Street by University of Chicago. The Dearborn uh, bike lane, uh, this was a, a classic situation where you had too much capacity, four lanes and 8,000 cars a day. The result? car speed. So cycling was scary, and PEDS had a wide road to cross. Now, with the bike lanes on the left, parking moved over. There's a buffer, so it's safer. Two full car lanes and a bus lane, which is regularly violated anyway and used by cars. But that's fine. That's why we need BRT, right? And it's really a complete street now, reflective of the city, reflective of the loop, which, by the way, is the fastest growing urban core in the United States is the loop in Chicago. We're testing technology, bike signals and sensors, uh, that can actually trigger lights for uh, cyclists, but also in the turn lanes that we've added for cars. And fiberglass coverage over our metal grate bridges, so it's safe. There's another shot. This is a two-way bike lane, by the way, with signalization. And we've created the Smart Street Corridor on Dearborn, testing all types of technology and giving us incredible data which shows us that at certain times of the day, we have as many people on bikes as we do in cars. And we also see that when you give a cyclist their own light, it's amazing how they actually obey the light. When they don't have a light, and they don't have a space to be, they typically act more like rogues, rogue cyclists. Here's another before and after. Simple changes, not expensive, less than $100,000 a mile changes the way it feels. Here's an industrial area that now uh, provides a link between two neighborhoods. So we plan on having 645 miles of bike lanes by 2020. Now, the big game changer is also Divi, because it's one thing to build all this infrastructure. It's another thing to give people easy access to bikes at less than 20 cents a day 
a bike that's upright and comfortable, you can ride it in a suit or in a skirt with heels with thousands of docks around the city. Bike sharing is growing dramatically. And as I said earlier, we use CMAQ funding to fund, federal funding to fund about 80%. With the sponsorship and advertising that we have, this is going to be profitable. This will be a profitable uh, transit option for the city. How many profitable tra transit systems are there that you're aware of in the United States? Zero. P uh, possibly capital bike share and a few other bike share systems. Very easy to use. It's like iGo or Zipcar, but it's point to point, so you don't have to bring it back. Seven bucks for 24 hours, $75 annually. That's unlimited 30 minute or less trips. And that's why we cluster the stations so closely together. You have docks, kiosks, and ad panels. These are solar powered. There's no construction. There's no electrical hookup. Uh, they're modular, so you can expand them and grow them as they get busier. They're mobile. So uh, actually, the day after we launched, we had to move some of the uh, stations because the Blackhawks won, and we're going to have two million people coming downtown. Um, they're wireless, and they're self-supporting financially at scale. So can you afford bike share? I would argue you can't afford not to have bike share, as long as you build a large enough system that it's really a useful transportation option. So we're going to have 4,000 bikes and 400 stations. It's so successful already in the first two months that we are already uh, um, getting funding for an expansion. And the suburbs are now getting on board. Oak Park uh, and Evanston already want to grow the system. Here's an example of them being put in. You just crane them right into place. There's RFID. You turn them on, and they're ready to go. And I'm going to skip, because I'm out of time, to the end, which is just that government can do a better job of marketing its services. All the things that we do, whether it's coming out to events like this and having the opportunity to speak to people, uh, using social media, um, or creating brands that people love. And there was a headline last week, Chicagoans love Divi. So I'll close with a 30 second video um, that was a, a piece of how we built the um, Divi brand, if they have it. And if not, there we go. Or not. Or yes? We, ha we have um, 4,000 blue bikes, but we have one red bike. It's a fun little marketing ploy. fun making that. Um, for those of you that, that are on Twitter, search Divi Red, hashtag, uh, and you will be amazed at how many people uh, post photos because they were, they were seen with the bike or they got the bike, and people are winning prizes uh, like red key fobs and red t-shirts. So in closing, uh, I think our jobs can be fun. I think the transportation options that, that we provide and the work that we do can be a lot of fun, and we can communicate that more clearly to the public. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Gabe. Oh, thank you. And uh, what a gracious representative from the city of Chicago. Thank you so For much. For those of you that would like to meet and uh, mm -hmm. have a little discussion with uh, Mr. Klein, he will be up in the Chicago Hospitality in the uh, uh, lobby uh, by the registration area. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Are you riding that out? <laughs> okay, all right. I'm going to get out of your way. Okay, you probably, uh, hey now, you probably won't have to move those uh, kiosks of bikes again for the Blackhawks because they probably won't win for a while. Anyway, oh, give know. it up for Gabe. Oh, let it go. I don't even know hockey. Let it go. Give it up for Gabe Klein and Larry Stevens. There they go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, be back here tomorrow morning for more surprises, more possible giveaways. Enjoy the expo. Have a great day. We will see y'all tomorrow. Thank you for being here. Bye bye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this morning. 
Don't forget tonight's awards and recognition ceremony right here at 5 p.m. And be sure to join us for Continuing the Conversation, featuring many special guests at today's Expo Experience. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day here at the best show in Public Works. Public Works, engineering change.